So if you've got your Bible, let's find that out. Let's open up our Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Um, And and we're going to be jumping right in. Uh, This morning we're going to be looking at the first 15 verses of this chapter. And so let's just jump in, pick it up, and look at Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 1 up to, up to verse 15. Acts chapter 16, verse 1, it says, Then he came to Derbe and to Lystra, and, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. And, and he was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. And, and Paul wanted to give wanted to have him go with him uh, and, and so he took him and had him circumcised because of the Jews who were in that region for they all knew that his father was a Greek and, and, and as they went through the cities they delivered to them the, de- the decrees to keep which were determined by the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem so the churches were strengthened in, in faith and they increased in number daily now when they had gone through uh, Phrygia and, and, and Galatia they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia And after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran down to a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day we came to Neapolis, and from there we came to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony, and we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now, a certain woman named Lydia heard us, and she was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. And the Lord opened her heart to heed the things that were spoken by Paul. And, and, and when she and her whole household were baptized, she begged us, saying, if, if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, well, then come to my house and stay. And so she persuaded us. And so, Father, this morning as we, as we come into your presence and as we, as we look at your word this morning, we pray, Lord, that, that you would reveal to us uh, what, what your plan is, what, what your will is for our lives, Lord, that you would help us to, to, to learn some steps, to learn some principles uh, that, that we might apply to, to know what, what you have in mind for us, what your will, what, what your plan would be. Lord, we also understand that, that to, to, to accomplish your will means that we need to surrender in this place, that we need to, 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 to surrender our plans, uh, to submit ourselves to you, to surrender our hopes, our dreams. And, and so, Lord, we pray this morning, not my will be done, but rather thy will be done. Lord, that your will would be done, that you would have your way with us. So we pray this now in Jesus' name, and everyone say it. Amen. Well, now, the, the title of this message this morning, as we, as we get into the first part of Acts chapter 16, the title of the message is Closed Doors. Closed Doors. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you, when you pray, have ever prayed for a closed door? <laughs> I'll tell you what. That's not how I pray. I mean, when I, when I pray, I don't pray for a closed door. I pray for open doors, right? You know, I'm like, I'm like you know, hey, you know, Lord, you know, I just pray that if, if this is your will, I just pray that you would bless me. I just pray that you would, you know, have favor on me. Lord, if this is your will, I pray that you would open this door or open that door. Or, Lord, you know, if it's your will, just, just give me a sign. You know, like, like nothing but green lights on the way to work or something. Or, you know, uh, maybe, maybe speaking of lights, like maybe that light outside of Krispy Kreme, the one that says, hot, fresh. Like, if it's your will for me to get a donut, just have that sign, light up. I mean, that's how I pray, right? I, I, I pray for open doors. But what if I told you this morning that, that, that closed doors can actually be a good thing? What if I were to tell you this morning that, 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 that God not only uses the open doors, but he also uses the closed doors? doors. And so that's what we see this morning here in Acts chapter 16 as, as the Apostle Paul now is, is making what is, what, is, what is often called his second missionary trip, his second missionary journey. And, and as he is, he's, he's praying and he's, and he's saying, you know, Lord, I, I pray that, that, that you, would, you would give me direction. Sh- show, me, show me where to go. Lord, that you would, you would give me open doors. And yet this morning, instead of getting open doors, the Apostle Paul encounters one closed door after another closed door. In fact, this morning, the Apostle Paul discovers that God not only uses the open door, but God uses the closed door. So now with that, as we go back to verse 1, in fact, as we read verses 1 through 5, 
we, we first of all are reminded of, a, of an open door that Paul had encountered in his life once before. An open door that he had encountered earlier in his life. And so with that, verse 1 says again, Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who who were at Lystra and Iconium, and Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and so he took him and had him circumcised because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And, And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep which were determined by the apostles and elders down in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in, in the faith and increased in number daily. Now, as, as we look at this section, let's keep in mind that, that last week we saw that, 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 that the Apostle Paul and his longtime partner in the ministry, Barnabas, had, had a falling out with each other, right? You know, they, they, they had a falling out, and it got so bad that in the end they, they actually parted ways. They went, went two different directions. So Barnabas takes his, his nephew, John Mark, with him, and he goes in one direction. And so meanwhile, Paul takes, takes Silas, and they go in a different direction. And, and as far as we know, as, as we mentioned last time, these two, Paul and Barnabas, never got back together. They, 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 they never really talked with each other again. As far as we know, these two never really hooked back up and, and worked together again. Uh, they, in fact, the, uh, the Bible, the, the word that's used there that they separated, uh, we mentioned last week is a word uh, in the original language of the Bible. That it, it's the root for, for the word divorce. It means that they separated permanently. Uh, in other words, that they never got back together. You know, it's kind of like, kind of like my wife. Uh, now, now my wife and I, we've we've been married for 21 years. It's the best mistake she's ever made. Um, and, and and but before we before we even met, years before we met, she she was dating some other guy. And in fact, as far as I remember, I think his name was Loser. Uh, no, really, that's a true story. Uh, and so I, <laughs> I I think that you know that they, they were they were dating, and, but but things just didn't work out. They 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 did, you know they didn't stay together. They broke up. You know, and, and you know it's kind of that you know let's just be friends. You remember how that was back in the day? Let's just be friends. Well, in fact, what my wife said was, hey, let's just be friends that don't talk. Um, and so in a sense, I think that's what's happened with Paul and Barnabas. They stopped talking. They, 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 they were no longer working together. And so uh, Barnabas, you know, he grabs his nephew, and, and they go back to Cyprus, which was his hometown. And now meanwhile, Paul and, and, and Silas, they go and they visit some of the churches that, that, that Paul had planted five years before this five years ago. And so they go to, to all these different cities and, 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 and they visit these churches. And along the way, they want to pick up Timothy. And so verse 1 tells us that they, that they came to the cities of Derby and Lystra. Now listen, Paul has not been there for five years. So five years later, he's now coming back. In fact, you may remember that, that we read about Paul's visit the first time to, to, to these cities all the way back in, in Acts chapter 14. In fact, the very first time that Paul came to, to, to the city of Lystra back in Acts chapter 14, we saw that, that his first visit was no picnic, right? I mean, when the apostle Paul came there, I mean, he, you know, he, he's preaching the gospel, but then all of a sudden this, this riot breaks out. There's this angry mob, and, and they start beating him, and they start stoning him with rocks. In fact, they tried to kill him. In fact, they actually thought he was dead, and they left him for dead. Now, as it turns out, Paul wasn't actually dead. He was just mostly dead. You know, like Princess Bride? He's not, there's a big difference between being all dead versus mostly dead. He's just mostly dead. And so, you know, they, they leave him for dead, but he gets back up. And what does he do when he gets back up? He, he marches right back into the same city in front of those same people who just tried to kill him. And he, and he keeps preaching. He's like, you know, now, now where was I before I was so rudely interrupted? And, and so he just keeps preaching. Now, how, how did the Apostle Paul view this? I mean, how did Paul view their attack? How did Paul view when, 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 they, when they beat him and when they stoned him and they tried to kill him? How did Paul view that? Well, it's interesting because uh, towards the end of Acts chapter 14, where we're told that the Apostle Paul goes uh, back to the church in Antioch and he kind of gives them a progress report. He lets them know how, how, how everything is going in, in all these different places where he's visited, including cities like Lystra. He lets them know what, what God was doing there and how God was using them. In fact, this is what it says. It says in Acts chapter 14, verse 27, it says, Now when they had come and gathered the church together... They reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. 
He opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. In other words, Paul uh, viewed the, the beating he just got. Paul viewed the, the stoning, them trying to kill him, them leaving him for dead. He viewed that as an open door. As an open door. You know, I happen to think that most of us, we'd probably see it a little differently. You know, I mean, just one beating, let alone the stonings and everything else. I mean, you know, something like this happens to us, and I, I think we'd probably be like, you know, I think God might be closing this door. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, this is a sign. You know, I, I, you know I, I, I don't think these people want us around here. I'm pretty sure God's telling us that, that, that we're to move on, that this is a closed door, but not, not the Apostle Paul. You see, this just reminds us that oftentimes, quite frankly, what, what we might call a closed door, God might be calling an open door. He might be calling it an open door. And so Paul comes back to, to the city of Lystra, hasn't been there for five years, and then when he gets there, he, 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 he's coming back for Timothy. Now, you, you may remember that, that 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, uh, the apostle Paul calls Timothy his son in the Lord, his son in the faith. And so this seems to imply that, that the apostle Paul was the one who, who led Timothy to faith in Jesus Christ. And so in a sense, Paul kind of feels like he's, he, he's, he, he's, he's Timothy's honorary uh, father, his, his, his spiritual sur surrogate dad, so to say. In fact, it's interesting. Um, the text here in Acts chapter 16 seems to imply that, that Timothy's biological father might have passed away. Because it keeps saying, it says it two different times, that, that, that his dad was a Greek. Now, it's not saying that, you know, now he self-identifies as Chinese uh, or something like that. No, it, it's, it's past tense, but it's saying he was a Greek. He's not Greek anymore. What, what is he? Well, now he's dust. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And so it seems to imply that, that maybe his biological father is no longer around and, and that in a sense, after Paul led Timothy to faith in Jesus Christ, Paul kind of feels that, 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 that he has that responsibility. He's kind of his spiritual surrogate father in the faith. And so now Paul comes back and he, and, and he picks up Timothy. And so now Timothy has, has the chance to, to basically become Paul's assistant in the ministry, to basically become, you know, Paul's intern in the ministry. And so now Timothy gets this, gets this wonderful opportunity to go out on the mission field with the Apostle Paul, to do ministry with the Apostle Paul. But here's where things get weird. Now all of a sudden the Bible says that, that Paul has Timothy get circumcised. No, you know, I mean, you, you, you think about this. I mean, you know, you, I mean, you know, let, let's say this is you. The Apostle Paul's coming to you. And he's like, you know what? I want you to be my partner in ministry. And you're like, oh, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I want you to, to be my assistant. I want you to be my intern. I want you to go with me, and, 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 and we're going to see what God's going to do. And you're going to be like, yeah, this is wonderful. And you need to get circumcised. Oh, I think you've got the wrong guy. <laughs> no, you know, you, you, I think you're looking for the other Timothy. Yeah, but, but, but we read a passage like this and we're like, you know, wait a minute. I mean, what is going on here? I mean, back in Acts chapter 15, wasn't the apostle Paul the one who was fighting against circumcision? I mean, you remember Acts chapter 15, right? Remember what was happening there? There was this group that came on the scene and they were basically telling people that the only way you can get saved and really become a Christian is to first to convert to Judaism, first become Jewish. So they're saying, you know, you had to get circumcised and all these other things. You had to convert to Judaism, and then you could believe in Jesus and go to heaven. And so there was this big debate and, and, and all of that. And, and, you, and you think, yeah, but wasn't Paul the one that was fighting against circumcision? Well, yes, he was. Well, then why all of a sudden is, is Paul the one now having Timothy get circumcised? I don't know, but that's the end of the sermon. Let's pray. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Yeah, well, now listen, as, as, as we read this passage, we, we first of all need to keep in mind that, that, that as Timothy's getting circumcised, this had nothing to do with Timothy's salvation. This had nothing to do with Timothy going to heaven. It had nothing to do with Timothy becoming a Christian. Because if you're reading this passage, then, then it's clear in the context that at this point in time, Timothy already is a Christian. He already is a believer in Jesus Christ. He's not trying to become one. He already is one. So this has nothing to do with him becoming a Christian or, 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 or getting saved. He already is saved. You see, this had everything to do with being Jewish. Had nothing to do with being a Christian. Had nothing to do with becoming a Christian. This had something to do with being Jewish. Now, now listen. 
Do you remember what that whole debate in Acts chapter 15 was about? When, when Paul went, went down to Jerusalem and, and, and they're debating back and forth with, with the rest of the apostles and they're debating uh, you know, over, over you know, whether a Gentile, a non-Jewish person, first has to convert to Judaism and get circumcised and all these other things. So they're debating that and debating that and debating that until finally at the end, all the apostles agreed that, you know what? Salvation is by grace and grace alone. No, you, you don't have to convert to Judaism. No, you don't have to get circumcised. You don't have to do any of these, these works or rituals. It's not about that. They said, you know what? It's just by grace. And so they, 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 they all agree on that. And so they're agreeing that the way that a Gentile gets saved is by grace. But here's the thing. Timothy, if, if you're reading this passage correctly, Timothy was not a Gentile. In fact, as I'm reading the Bible, my Bible tells me that he was half Greek and half Jewish. Not only that, but it actually tells us that, that his mother was Jewish. Now, this is a very important detail because, you see, all the way back in, in that day, and it's still true to this very, very day, that, 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 if, that if, 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 if your mother, if she's Jewish, then that by default makes you Jewish. It's always tracked and traced through the mother's line. And so if your mother was Jewish, then you were automatically Jewish. And so in this case, Timothy's mother was Jewish. That would make him by, by blood, that would make him by birth, Jewish. But the problem was that the Bible tells us two different times that his father was a Greek, which would seem to imply that perhaps his dad, when, when Timothy was born, decided, you know what? We're not going to follow the Jewish customs. We're going to follow the Greek customs. In other words, Timothy was never circumcised. He was never circumcised. And, and, and here's the problem. The problem with that is, is that because he, even though he was Jewish by blood, Jewish by default, because he wasn't circumcised, the rest of the Jewish community w w would never accept him. They, they, they would never welcome him. They would never embrace him as being one of their own. He would always be an out outsider. He, he, because because he, he, he wasn't a full Jew. He wasn't a complete Jew. He wasn't a real Jew, in their opinion. And so this had nothing to do with, with Timothy becoming a Christian. This had everything to do with, with being Jewish, with, with being Jewish. But, but why, why did this even matter? I mean, why is this even important? Well, I'm glad you asked, and, and I'll tell you. Uh, the, the, what, what made this so important is because the, the, the Apostle Paul, he, he realized that as they went on this journey, as they went on this missionary trip, they, they would go uh, to city, to city, to city, and the first thing that they would do, and Paul did this every single time, the first thing they would do is, is that Paul would, 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 would go to a Jewish synagogue hoping that because he still looks like a rabbi that they would ask him to be the guest speaker. And then he would take advantage of that opportunity to preach the gospel. And so they would go to all these different city, uh, cities and, and look for Jewish synagogues. But at the same time, Paul knew that, that because, because uh, Timothy wasn't circumcised, that when they came into these new cities, he might not be fully welcomed as, as, as being a part of that community. In other words, Paul realized that this might be a roadblock in Timothy's ability, Timothy's efforts to try to reach out to the Jewish community because, because they, they, they wouldn't accept him. And so uh, Timothy, you know, he, he has to make a choice. And this choice had nothing to do with becoming a Christian. It was a choice of, of, of becoming fully Jewish so that he could reach more Jewish people. In the same way, you know, I, I think sometimes, you know, a lot of us, we, we, we might have something in our life that, that's kind of become a roadblock to ministry, a roadblock to reaching people in our lives. You know, maybe it's something in our background, maybe, maybe it's something in our culture, maybe it's something that we struggle with, or, or for that matter, maybe it's a, an, a, an issue of freedom, an issue of liberty that the Lord's allowed us to do. You know, like, for example, you know, maybe the Lord is, has allowed you to have an occasional drink of alcohol every now and then. You know, you don't get drunk, you don't drink to excess, you just have like one drink every now and then, and, and, as, and as far as you and the Holy Spirit go, the Holy Spirit's fine with that. He, he, there's no conviction there, he's fine with that. But here's the problem. Maybe there's someone else in your life. Maybe, maybe there's an alcoholic in your family or, or an alcoholic that you work with. And even though you and the Holy Spirit are, are fine with this, this other person has an issue with it. And because they're an alcoholic, every time they see you, a so-called Christian, having a drink, it kind of stumbles them. It, it kind of trips them up. It becomes kind of a roadblock for you to actually effectively be able to reach them for Jesus. Well, that's what, that's what this issue of circumcision was for Timothy. As, as, as they would go from city to city to these new synagogues. No, listen, I don't know how this worked. 
I don't know if they had somebody stand at the door saying, you know, hey, prove to me that you're Jewish. I mean, I, I don't really know how this worked. I don't really want to know how this worked. But, but the idea is, 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 the, is, is that he was doing this not to get saved, not to become a Christian, but as a Christian, he was doing this to reach more Jewish people for Jesus. Here, here's how the Apostle Paul put it. The Apostle Paul uh, said in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20, he said, to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. Then he goes on, he says, you know, to the Greeks, I became like the Greeks, and to this person, I became like that person. He says, you know what, to the weak, I became weak to reach the weak. He says, you know what, I've become all things to, to all men so that by all possible means, I might save some. And so it's the idea that, you know, when you're in Rome, you do as the Romans do. Or in this context, when you're in a Jewish synagogue, you do as the Jews do, if you want to reach the Jews. And so, and so that, that's the idea. It, 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 was, it was for outreach purposes. You know, it reminds me of, of uh, years back, I read about the, the police department in Oakland, California. And they were wanting to step up their efforts to, to, to do community outreach. So what they did was they got a new cop car, but it was unlike any cop car you've ever seen. What did they get? They got a lowrider. I'm not making this up. Now, it, was, it, you know, it, had, it had their logo on it. It had the lights and the sirens. But you know what? They also, they also pimped that ride. I mean, I mean they, had, they had chrome wheels and, 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 and hydraulic lifts and, and, and a 500-watt stereo system. And, I mean, this bad boy was just pimped, you know, and it was, it was, just, you know, it was just thumping and rocking. And, 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 and the police department, they would use it in an effort to try to build relationships with the inner-city teenagers that were out there. And so in the same sense, it's kind of what, what's happening here. Timothy is allowing himself to get circumcised to, to bridge that gap, uh, to, to build relationships so that he can reach as many Jewish people as, as he possibly can so that this would not be a roadblock in his ministry. And so uh, first there was this, this open door. The open door for the Apostle Paul was, was when he went to, to Lystra five years ago. He got beaten. Uh, he got stoned, left for dead. But in the, in, in the process, as a result, people came to Christ. People got saved, including young Timothy, who now five years later is going with Paul as his assistant. And so now as we pick it up, however, in, in verses 6 through 8, now we see that they, 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 they experience closed doors. Closed doors. Verse 6 now, when they had gone through Phrygia and, and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit would not permit them. So, passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And so here's the, here's the picture. Uh, it, it says that, 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 that Paul and, and his, his partners in the ministry, that would be Silas and now Timothy, you know, they're, they're, they're getting ready to embark on this mission trip. And so they're praying and they're, they're praying for open doors. They're praying that, you know, that God would, would, would bless them and, and, and give them fruitful ministry, good opportunities for, for, for ministry. And so they, 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 you know, they march over to the, to the region of Phrygia. And then from there, they, they go to the Galatian region. And then they, then they try to go to Asia, but then it says they were forbidden. It says the Holy Spirit forbid them to preach the word in Asia. Now, it's interesting that the word forbidden that's used here, koluo in the Greek, it, it's a word that means to hinder. It means to, to, to prevent or to restrain or, or to hold back. No, no, we're not sure exactly what happened. I mean, we, we don't know exactly what happened, but evidently something was going on that held Paul back, that, that stopped him from going. Now, by the way, some Bible teachers believe that it, that it was at this point that Paul might have contracted malaria. Now, now we do know that Paul contracted malaria. In fact, it, it affected his eyesight. We just don't know exactly when he got malaria. But, but some believe it might have been at this particular time. Others believe that, that maybe it was just some other kind of a sickness, but that something was happening. What, whatever it was, something happened that, that closed that door. So they, they want to go to Asia. The Holy Spirit closes that door. And then their sights are set on, 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 on Mysia. And then from there, they want to go to Bithynia. But then it says that the Spirit would not let them. The Spirit would, would not permit them to go. And so it's like, bam! One closed door. Bam! Another closed door. Bam! Another closed door. Another closed door. And another closed door. It's like, it's like every attempt that they make to launch out to do some kind of ministry always ends up with the same result. Always ends up with the same answer. No. Everywhere they go, they hear, no, 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 no. It's kind of like my new relationship with my new puppy. And by the way, thank you for that. 
I got to tell you, my, my puppy loves us. He loves being around us. In fact, he loves us so much, he wants to be with us even when we're trying to sleep. Um, but, <laughs> but, but as much as he loves us, no is not his favorite word right now. And so it, it's like the Apostle Paul. You just keep hearing, no, 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 no. This door shuts and that door shuts. They, they try to go to Phrygia and, 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 and slam the door shuts. Galatia, slam another door. Mysia, slam a door. Bithynia, slam that door shuts. You know, it's like the guy who prayed and, and, and he wrote it down in the form of a poem and he said, before me, closed doors. Why? I, I know not. He, 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 he promised to provide. Has he forgot? I cannot seem to find the proper key. Oh God, why do these doors stay locked for me? And maybe that's how the Apostle Paul feels. You know, why, why are these doors locked? I mean, it's, 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 it, this door's closed and that door's closed. I mean, listen, it wasn't like Paul was trying to do something sinful. He was just trying to preach the gospel. He just wanted to go to Asia and preach the gospel. I mean, after all, doesn't the Bible say go into all the world and preach the gospel? Well, Paul's like, you know what? Asia, that's in all the world. I want to go there and preach the gospel. Holy Spirit says, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll, I'll go to Bithynia. That's in all the world. And the Holy Spirit says, no, 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 no. One door closes and another door closes. In fact, it's interesting. When it says that the Holy Spirit would not let them go or the Holy Spirit did not permit them to go, this, this has always intrigued me when, when I read this. You know, because I wonder, well, you know, how, how did the Holy Spirit reveal this to him? I mean, you know, was it, was it just a, a lack of peace or something? You know, have you ever had this happen, you know, where, where you know, maybe, maybe you're heading into a certain situation and, and you know, and, and everything on the outside looks, look, looks fine. It looks great on the outside, but, you know, in, in, your, in your heart, inside your heart, it's like, it's like you get this, this red flag or something. You know, inside your heart, there's like this lack of peace. You, 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 just, you just have this sense that, that something's not right. You just have this sense that, that you, you, you don't really know if you should, you know, you do this thing or, 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 or go here, o- over here to this place or, or, or get involved in this relationship with these people or, or sign this contract or, or whatever it is. You, you just kind of have this lack of peace, this, this, this red flag. You see, sometimes the way God says no is by simply closing the door. By simply closing the door. You know, and so uh, that, that door being closed, you know, it, it might be God leading you. You know, maybe, maybe it's as simple as your car not starting or, or, or your flight getting canceled or, or, you know, or whatever it is, you know, this, this thing that you thought you would do or this thing that you, you desperately wanted to do and, 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 you, and you really want to do it. In fact, you're, you're trying to make it happen. And, and the harder you try to make it happen and the more you want it to happen, the, the worse things are getting. And it's not happening. And it gets frustrating. It gets frustrating to the point that you're like, you know, Lord, Lord, I mean, why, 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 is, this why is this happening? Why, why, why aren't you doing this? I mean, Lord, I, I mean, I even I prayed about this. this. Can I just, just say this? Just, just because, just because you, prayed you prayed about it, about it that, doesn't that doesn't automatically mean that he's obligated, obligated to say yes. You know, that's how we pray. I prayed about, pray about, it, about it, and he's, he's, not, he's not doing it yet. He's not, he's not giving me what I want. He's like, okay, he's like, you're praying, you're praying like you're three. But having a temper tantrum. I mean, listen, I mean, listen. You know, you know. Do you do you remember the remember that no no is an is an answer? I mean, we do tell that to our kids, don't we? No no is an answer. You know, and, 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 and so you so pray, 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 and you know what? It's never occurred to you. Maybe, maybe he's, he's saying, saying no. no. And so he closes, he closes the, door. the door. He's closing, he's the, closing the door because he's saying, saying no. no. Or, or then again, you know, again, something you know, else I discovered is, 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 is that sometimes, sometimes that, that, that door that's door closed for you, it's closed for you because it's not your door. It's closed for you because because it's someone else's open door. It's not meant for you. It, 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 yeah, it's, it's on God's heart. God wants it to be done. It, it's a good idea. God wants it to happen, and it's going to happen. He just doesn't want you to do it. It's someone else's open door. You, know, you think of King David, for example. King David, you know, he, he, he wanted to build a house for the Lord. You know, that, that, was, that was the desire of his heart. He, he wanted to build a house for the Lord. And so he prayed about it. And, and what did the Lord say? The Lord said, no, David, you, you can't do it. But I'll tell you what, your son can. And so that uh, David was allowed to, to, to drop the blueprints. He was allowed to, to collect all the building materials. But he was not allowed to build the house because that was the job for his son, Solomon. And so David's closed door was Solomon's open door. And so sometimes that door's closed for you because it's someone else's open door. But now as we, as we pick it up in verses 9 and 10, we see that, that sometimes it's the closed doors that lead us to the open doors. Sometimes the closed doors lead us to the open doors. Verse 9, 
And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now notice, by the way, the, the, the uses now of the words we and us. It's no longer just Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Now it's we and us. Who's the we and us? Well, it's, it's the author, Dr. Luke. And so this is Luke's way of telling you that it wasn't just Paul and, and, and Silas and Timothy, but Dr. Luke was also a part of this missionary team. He was on board. He was a part of this. He was traveling with them. And, says, and so he says, we minister to them. We and us. So here, here's, here's the thing. Paul has this vision. His famous vision of the man in Macedonia calling and, and asking and saying, you know, come and help us. And so uh, Paul shares the vision with his, with his partners in ministry. With, with Silas and with Timothy and also with Dr. Luke. And, and they, then they pray about it. And after praying about it, they all come to the same conclusion that this is the Holy Spirit. That, that the Holy Spirit's telling them to, to go to Macedonia. And so they go there. But now think about this. I mean, up until this point, it has been one closed door after another closed door. They want to go here. That door closes. They want to go over here. That door closes. And now all of a sudden, here's an open door. You see, and this just reminds us that, that sometimes the, it, it's the closed doors that help you figure out the open doors. It's the closed doors that help you recognize which doors are open. I mean, you know, you know maybe, maybe you're stepping out in faith and, 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 you're, and you're hoping that God will, will, will speak to you and, and, and he'll, he'll, he'll show you his plan. He'll, he'll show you his will for your life. And so you step out and then bam, that door shuts. You step out again, and this door shuts. You step out again, bam, another closed door, another closed door, another closed door. Hey, listen, you go through enough closed doors, eventually uh, you, you'll begin to recognize the one that's open. And so oftentimes the closed doors help you recognize which doors are actually opening. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe it's like this. Maybe, even, maybe you've been praying about, about how you can get more involved. You know, maybe you're praying, you know, and, and you're asking the Lord to, to, to show you how you can serve in your church. And so you're praying and you're praying, but, but you know, and, and, and you, you feel like, like God's not speaking to you. You feel like, like you don't have any leading. You don't know what to do. Can I just give you some advice on this? Listen, what you need to do is do something. Don't just wait for it to just magically come to you. Oh, gee, I think I'm called to preach the gospel. I'm going to move to Russia and be a missionary. Don't just, you know, do something. Just, just start something and see what happens. You know, step out somewhere. You know, maybe, for example, you, 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 you step out and you start serving in the children's ministry and you get involved there, but then all of a sudden that door closes for you. Well, hey, listen, don't let that discourage you. Don't stop there. You just, 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 you know, go to another door. You know, and so maybe you, maybe you now get involved in the youth ministry and you start helping there. But then again, maybe that door closes. You know, and then maybe in the process, you also discover something about yourself. Maybe you discover that you don't have the, the gift of teaching. Listen, that's not a bad thing. It just means that the Holy Spirit hasn't given you the gift of teaching. And so now what that means is now you can go through the, the checklist, so to say, and you can cross out all the things that have to do with teaching because now you know that, that God hasn't made you that way. He hasn't given you that gift, so you don't need to sweat that. You don't need to even, even worry about those. You can take all those off the list. And so you just keep serving and, and, and you keep finding a place and yet this door closes and that door closes and this door closes. But then all of a sudden, one day you're sitting in a church service and, and maybe, for example, you, you hear that they announce it, that they need some help with bookkeeping. And all of a sudden you're like, you know, I have an accounting degree. Maybe, maybe I'll sign up for this. And so you step out and you sign up and, and all of a sudden you, you discover that it's like a perfect fit. It's like you were made for this. It's like a hand in a glove. But you see, in a sense, it might have been a series of closed doors that helped you find the open door. And so that's what happens with the Apostle Paul. Bithynia closes, Asia closes, and, and now Macedonia is open. And now as they pick it up in verse, verse 11 through 15, ultimately Paul learns that God can use the closed door. And so verse 11 Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day we came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a foremost city in, the, in that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where, where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us, and she was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, who worshipped God. And the Lord opened her heart to, to, to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, if, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. 
So she persuaded us. And so now, you know, Paul has, has one closed door after another closed door, and then finally he gets this vision to go to Macedonia. And so now they, they, they come to, to the city of Philippi, one of the biggest cities in all that region. And, and, and they come there, and, 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 and Paul, just like he does in, in, in all the other times when he, when he goes to a new city, Paul starts trying to find a, a, a synagogue, a Jewish synagogue, where he can preach the gospel. But in this particular case, he comes to this city, and there is no Jewish synagogue, which seems to imply that there were not enough Jewish people living in that city to even justify having a synagogue. In fact, by the way, here's, here's what the Jewish law would say. The Jewish law said that, that you had to have at least 10 Jewish men living in the same city in order to justify having one synagogue in that city. And so evidently, there, there, there weren't even 10 Jewish men living in the city. And, and so Paul, he, he tries to find a synagogue. He can't find one, so he goes down to the river, hoping maybe to find some Jewish men, and instead he finds a, a group of Jewish women. Now, now, now by the way, you, you need to understand that, that, that to the Jews in, in, in their system of worship, flowing water, like, like a river, was, was, was very, very important. It was a very important element to worship. Now, now why is that? Why, 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 why would flowing water be so important? Well, because keep in mind that, 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 that to the Jewish person, one of the most sacred aspects of, of their worship service, besides offering sacrifices, one of the most sacred aspects of their worship service was, was what was called ceremonial cleansing, or, or, or the mikvah bath. We, we talked about that a few weeks ago. Now listen, if, if you did not have a, a synagogue that had a built-in mikvah bath, then what you could do is use the next best thing, which was flowing water or a river. And so Paul comes to town. There, 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 there is no synagogue. So he thinks, you know what? I'll go to the river to see if there's a group of guys there, maybe, maybe having a prayer meeting or something, and I'll try to share the gospel with them. But he gets there. He doesn't find a small group of guys. He finds a small group of women. You know, having like a, you know, I don't know, women of faith conference or something. You know, but listen, this was not what the Apostle Paul was expecting, right? He wasn't expecting to find a group of women. Listen, he had a vision of a man in Macedonia. And he can't even find one man. He just finds a group of women. Now, among this group of women is, is a woman by the name of, of Lydia. And evidently, Lydia was a, was a very affluent uh, businesswoman. In fact, the Bible tells us that she was a seller of purple. Now, you know, we read that and we're like, you know, what? that doesn't even make any sense. I mean, how do you sell a color? How do you sell purple? I mean, what, was she the owner of, like, you know, Purple R Us or, you know, like, Purple Mart? I mean, how do you sell purple? Well, what this meant was, 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 that, was that basically she, 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 she sold and distributed expensive clothing, expensive clothing that was dyed in purple. Now, it was, the, it was the purple dye that made it so expensive. You see, purple dye was very, very rare. In, in the way that they got it in those days, uh, they, they had to extract it, and it was a very difficult process to do this, but they had to extract it from, from a certain type of shellfish. It was very tedious, very painstaking, and so because it took so long and it was so hard, that, that purple dye was very, very, very expensive. And so because of this, purple was often considered the color of luxury or the color of royalty. In other words, Lydia's clientele were, were, were kings and queens or, 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 or anybody else who had enough money to dress like kings and queens. That was her clientele. In other words, this is basically telling us that, that, that Lydia was a fashionista, that, that, that Lydia was, was, was a fashion designer. I mean, what, what this is like is, is basically this would be like if, if Calvin Klein or, or, or better yet, if, if Donatella Versace or, 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 or Vera Wang you know, some of the more famous uh, clothing designers of, of, of our day, if, if they got saved, if they became Christians and they gave their lives to Jesus. And so this woman, Lydia, who, who was a well-known, very, very wealthy uh, clothing manufacturer, a clothing designer, she accepts Christ when Paul goes down to the river. And so what do we learn from a passage like this? Well, ultimately, we learn a, a very key principle when it comes to finding God's will for our life. Now, earlier, I had to show your hands. How many of you wanted to, to, to you know, find God's will? And all of you, but, but five that are in rebellion, raise your hands. <laughs> hey, you kept them down, not me. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, but we, we want to find God's will for our lives, right? And this is a key principle. In fact, this reminds me of a, of a single lady I heard about who, who was talking with her pastor, and, and she was telling her pastor how, how frustrated she was that she can't even find just, just one godly, one, one spiritual man who, who's, you know, attractive, of course, and has a good income and you know somebody that she would actually like being around but she can't find just just one 
you know, in, in the church, you know, so somebody to be interested in. Maybe, maybe they'd get to know each other, and, and who knows, maybe God would do something, and they'd get married. And so she, she was expressing her frustration over this. And, and she got so frustrated that finally the pastor warned her and, 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 and warned her uh, uh, not, not to force the will of God. And at that point, she, she said, well, pastor, I'm not trying to force the will of God. I'm just trying to get in on it. And you know what? Maybe, maybe that's how you are. Maybe, maybe you just want to get in on God's will right now. You're, you're trying to figure out God's will for your life. Well, before us this morning, uh, we see in the, in, the, in the life of the Apostle Paul this key principle, and that is simply this, that sometimes God uses the closed door. Don't just pray for the open doors. Don't, don't just watch for the open doors, but God can use the closed doors. Well, And listen to this. We also learn that, that sometimes things don't turn out the way we expect them to the way we think they're going to turn out. You know, Paul was expecting to, to meet a man in Macedonia. And so far, he's met nothing but, but women. Sometimes things don't turn out the way we expect it. Now with that, let me, let me share with you how, how God used this passage, Acts chapter 16, in, in, in my life. In fact, quite frankly, how, how God used this passage, Acts chapter 16, in your life, and you don't even know it. Yeah, and, and, and God used this passage to actually send me out here to Brighton to plant this church over 20 years ago. Here's what happened. O- over 20 years ago, I was, I was still an assistant pastor over at another, another Calvary Chapel called Crossroads. And, and, and as I was there, uh, you know, I, I was newly married. My wife and I, we'd been married for about a year or so. And, and all of a sudden, I started feeling like, like, like the Lord was, was leading me to, to start praying about planting a church. Now, I knew ever, ever since I became a Christian that one day I, I would plant a church. But now I felt the Lord was saying, you know what, now it's time to pray about that. Now, the Lord wasn't saying, hey, go plant a church right now. He was just telling me to pray, to, to, to get ready. Now, when, when I told my wife about this, if, if I remember correctly, I think her first reaction was to cry. No, I'm not making this up. She, you know, I, I told her, hey, I think it's time to pray about planting a church. And she cried, and she's like, you know, I, I, this is horrible. I mean, we're going we're gonna to be poor. We're going we're gonna to move out to, like, Bumsticks, Iowa, uh, you know, and pump gas for Jesus. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to be barefoot living in a shack. This is going to be horrible. And so, and so we kept praying, and, 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 and God was using this time to prepare our hearts. Now, during this time, I, I also started meeting with some friends of mine that, that were already pastoring their own churches. And so I started asking them, well, you know, how did you know uh, when, when to go out and plant your church? How did you know where to go and, and what to do? How did you know? What, what, how, what, you know, how did God get you prepared for this? And so I'd meet with them, and, and they would tell me, and, 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 and no matter what they told me, none of it helped me. I mean, they all had their, their own different stories, and every story was different from the other. And no matter what God did with them, God wasn't doing anything with their story in my life. Now, at one point, however, I was meeting with a friend of mine, Gino Geraci. Gino pastors uh, a church called Calvary Chapel, South Denver. And, and, and Gino and I were having lunch, and he said, you know what you ought to do? You ought to, you ought to plant a church uh, up, up in Longmont. I said, Longmont? Why Longmont? Uh, is, is the Holy Spirit telling you to, to, that I should go to Longmont? He says, no. Huh. Okay, well, do, do you know people in Longmont that are asking for a church? He says, nope. Well, then why are you telling me Longmont? No, I don't know. Just you got you to think about it. So my wife and I, we start praying about Longmont. In fact, here's what we did. Every Sunday after church, after, after I finished my ministry responsibilities over, over at Crossroads, we would get in the car, and we would drive up to Longmont, and we would pray. We'd drive all around the town, and we're like, oh, man, this is a cute town. And we're like, you know, it even has a Starbucks. This must be God. And so we're praying that, you know, oh, God, please just, just send us to Longmont. Just send us to Longmont. Just send us to Longmont. But here was the problem. The problem was, was that door was closed. That door was not opening. I mean, listen, we didn't know a single soul in Longmont, and nobody wanted us there. Now, meanwhile, what was happening, while we were praying, oh, Lord, send us to Longmont, meanwhile, at the same time, there were a handful of families up here in Brighton. Uh, the, 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 the Friedley family, the Fuller family, the Grind family, and, and the Buxton family, to name a few. They, they were up here, and they were writing letters to my pastor, Tom Stipe, asking him to, to send somebody to come out to Brighton to, to plant a Calvary Chapel out there. So Pastor Tom would, would give me those letters, and he'd say, hey, you, you know what? Pray about it. Pray about it. So I did, you know, being, being a, a faithful assistant pastor who, who would do what his, 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 his boss, his senior pastor, would tell him. I prayed about it. In fact, I prayed something like this. I, I think I prayed and said, oh, Lord, please, whatever you do, don't send me to Brighton. <laughs> Send me to Longmont. Now, in, in interest of full disclosure, the, the reason I prayed, you know, Lord, don't send me to Brighton, was because years and years before this, when I was a backslidden Christian, I'd been to Brighton before. And the only thing I could remember about Brighton were, were a Dairy Queen and a jail. 
And the reason I remember that was because when I was a backslidden Christian, I was locked up in that jail. And so I'm praying, you know, Lord, don't send me to Brighton. Well, at the, same, at the same time, I really felt like the Lord was convicting my heart and speaking to my heart and basically saying, you know what? You know, instead of asking everybody else what you should do, you ever think about asking me? You know, instead of asking everybody else what their wisdom is and, 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 and what, what they think, you know, you ever think about seeking my wisdom through my word? And, and, and I really felt like the Lord was saying, you know, if you, if you want to know how to plant a church, why don't you read how I planted churches in the book of Acts? So I started reading the book of Acts. And, and, and it was weird because even though the Apostle Paul was the, the same guy most of the time planting these churches, it's almost as if each church plant was different. Each city had an had a identity of its own, and so therefore the, the church plant took on its own identity. And so, you know, what worked in one city didn't work in another city. And then all of a sudden, I'm reading in Acts chapter 16, this passage that we read this morning, and it's like this passage just jumped off the face and hit me in the, in the face, just popped me. It just, just, it just jumped out and, and spoke to me. And, and, and it was like, you know, the Lord was showing me, you know what? Just like Paul had his eyes set on Bithynia, and yet the Holy Spirit forbid him, that door was closed. And instead, he gets a vision of a man in Macedonia. That's the door that's opening. Well, in the same way, it, it hit me that, that Longmont was my Bithynia. Nobody wanted me there. I didn't know anybody there. That door was closed. But then meanwhile, just like there was this man in Macedonia, there was more than one man. There were, there were handfuls of families saying, hey, come over here and help us. And, and it hit me that this was, 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 was my Macedonia. And it was right then and there that I knew that we were supposed to come out and plant this church. And that was over 20 years ago. And I, I got to tell you that, that, that 20 years later, I mean, this church has not been what I expected. In fact, quite frankly, it's even better than I ever expected. But it all started with, with closed doors, with God closing this door and God closing that door. Sometimes God uses the closed door to lead you. Now, not only that, but when it comes to finding God's will, uh, we, we, I should also remind you of something that James said. James tells us hey, not, not, not to boast about tomorrow. He says, you know, don't, don't, don't boast and say, hey, you know what, today I'm going to do this, and, and tomorrow I'm going to do that. He says, you don't even know what a day might hold. But instead, James says, in James chapter 4, verse 15, he says, instead, just say, if the Lord wills. We'll, we'll, we'll live and do this or do that. If the Lord wills. Pastor Chuck Smith used to always say that, that whenever you make plans for your life, you should always make your plans with a little P.S. at the end. A P.S. that simply says, if the Lord wills. Now listen, that doesn't mean that as a Christian you always have to use that phrase at, at, at every single conversation. You know, like, like your wife is saying goodbye to you on your way to work and she's like, you know, have a good day, honey. And you're like, well, I don't know, if the Lord wills. You know, and I've shared, I've shared this before, but maybe you're at church, and after church, somebody says, hey, you want to get a bite to eat? You want to go out to lunch? I don't know, if the Lord wills. But you know, you're hungry, he's talking to you, and you think, well, this must be God, because I'm hungry. So you decide, okay, we're going to go. And so you, you go to the restaurant, and, and you order your food. Maybe you order a cheeseburger. And the waitress says, would you like fries with that? And you're like, I don't know, if the Lord wills. But then you notice that everybody else is getting their food but you. You're the only one. And so finally, you grab your waitress, and you're like, you know, hey, are you, are you ever going to bring me my food? And she's like, I don't know, if the Lord wills. <laughs> and so when James is saying this, what James is saying is simply this. He's saying, you know what? It's okay to make plans in your life, but when you make your plans, you know, pray about it. Just say, hey, Lord, this is what I'm planning on doing. I'm planning on doing this, and I'm planning on doing that, but you know what, Lord? You're in charge, not me. You're my commander-in-chief. And so, Lord, I, I pray that ultimately you would direct my ways. So open whatever doors you want to open and, and close whatever doors you want closed. Lord, I, ultimately, I, I want your will to be done, not mine. Not my will be done, but thy will be done. And, and so what it's saying is that when, when you make plans in your life, make them in pencil so that, so that he can do the erasing, so that he can do the editing, so that he can lead you. Listen, Proverbs 16, verse 9 says, a, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And so, Father, we, we thank you for your grace. And Lord, we're, we're thankful that you are a God who leads his people. And so, Lord, we, we pray that you would lead us, Lord, that you would show us your plan for our lives, your, your will. But, Lord, help us not to just look for the, for the wonderful opportunities, the, the quote-unquote open doors. Lord, maybe it's a closed door that, that helps us to find what you want. But ultimately, Lord, it, 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 when it comes to finding your will, the key here is, is that, Lord, I am willing to surrender to your will. It's not my will be done. It's 
thy will be done. So have your way with me, Lord. I am just change in your pocket, and I'm asking you to spend me any way you want to. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we stand and worship the Lord?